Good afternoon, everyone. Please take your seats so we can get started. I think we're in for a treat. I'm certainly looking forward to the next two hours where we'll be discussing a very important topic uh, with a fantastic panel as well. Uh, as you know, the topic for the seminar is the right skills for the job with a question mark. Uh, I think uh, there's no questioning the importance of this agenda. All of us who work with our client countries hear and recognize the importance of job creation for those countries. And in the same breath, quite often, the next statement will be about, but we don't really have the right skills. Whether that statement is deserved or not remains to be seen, but typically, those are the kinds of concerns that we hear from our client countries. And the report that the bank team of Rita Almeida, David Ravalina, together with their co-author Jer Jerry Berman have produced is an important contribution to try and respond to that question. So we're going to be taking the next couple of hours, digging a little deeper into what is uh, included in this report. Let me just give you the choreography for the next couple of hours. Uh, we will start with an overview of the book, uh, the main messages that will be presented by David Rovalino. Uh, he'll have about 10 minutes to do that. Uh, after that, I'll introduce our five wonderful panelists, and I will pose each of them one question. Uh, after that, I'll open it up to the floor for about 30 minutes for open comments and questions. Uh, then we will wrap it up with one question, it's the same question that I will ask to all five panelists. And I think by then we will probably be done and wrap it up. Uh, so let me start immediately by turning it over to David. David uh, is a, uh, our lead uh, economist uh, working in the anchor the social protection team uh, and the head of the labor cluster that we have. David. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tamar. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, bon appetit. Thank you for coming. I'm going to take in these 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about the book, the motivation, what it does, some of the implications for the work we do here. It's a book that was, as Tamar was saying, edited by Rita Almeida, Jer Berman, who couldn't make it today, and myself, but with contributions from uh, several authors, Jung Jong Cho, Frederic Rotter, Joyce Nam, Ji Peng Tang, Maria Laura Sanchez Puerta, and Joachim Klube. So this is a book about skills development policies to improve job and earnings opportunities for current workers in middle and low income countries. So this is not about policies for children, infants, or future workers. This is about policies for those who are already in the labor force or soon to enter the labor force. And there are two specific problems that we are trying to address. One is that unfortunately, a large share of workers today have very low levels of education. The average number of years of schooling in middle-income countries is only eight, primary plus a couple of years. It is only five in low-income countries. So by definition, I'm so sorry, these are workers who have acquired only a very basic set of skills, if anything. And for them, the good jobs, jobs that can offer decent earnings and some security, might be simply out of reach. That's one problem. The other one is that even among those workers with higher levels of education, you still can see that often they have not acquired the skills they need to either fill in the vacancies that are available today or allow entrepreneurs to create the new jobs. I'm not only talking about the technical skills, how to program a computer, how to read a financial statement, or the cognitive skills, reading literacy. I'm talking about these more fluid behavioral non-cognitive skills how they communicate, how they work with others, whether they are open to new ideas, whether they are creative, discipline, perseverance, etc. So you end up in this situation, it's a dichotomy, where on one hand, you have a large share of workers who are in jobs which are not using their skills, 
actually our surveys show that this is the case for between 30 and 40 percent of youth. Some of them, of course, are also unemployed. And on the other hand, you have employers who are not able to fill entry-level vacancies because they cannot find the workers who have the right skills. And a recent survey that was done by McKinsey, and I think Mona is going to talk about it, shows that actually 45% of employers in these countries where the survey took place are, are in this situation. Now, I was talking about youth, but I think this problem of skills mismatch is also soon going to be affecting older workers. Workers that now have to stay longer in the labor force, this is a problem in ECA, while at the same time technologies are changing. So these are the two problems that the book tries to address. We look at the policies that countries can consider to reduce the incidence of the two problems. Let me tell you about uh, some of the messages. In the first part of the book, we actually argue that some of the things that countries have to do don't have anything to do with setting up training systems or financing training. It's more about improving the functioning of the product markets, labor markets, capital markets. It's about empowering workers, and it's about providing information, incentives to guide investments in training. We also talk about some of the systematic government failures, usually related to poor governance, the lack of capacity to deliver services, simply lack of information, failures that affect the, the performance of the classic government interventions in the area of training. TVT, technical vocation, education, and training, schemes to promote on the job training, and training related active labor market programs. To the point that often these problems, these programs become part of the problem as opposed to being part uh, of, the, of the solution. The second part of the book then takes a stock of some of these initiatives. We see what the countries have been able to achieve, what are the limitations. We do this based on impact evaluations and case studies. And then we come up with a set of recommendations about some of the things that could be done to improve design and implementation. So let me tell you a little bit more about some of the messages that are emerging. The first question that we ask, uh, I think it's a basic question, is why do we observe these skill gaps? these skills mismatches? Why do we have more workers and firms investing in the right type of training? You know, everybody here knows that there is a very important link between education and earnings, but there is also some data out there that I'm putting in this chart showing that those firms which are able to train can actually generate very important gains in terms of value added per capita. Well, you're going to tell me, whoa, 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 this is very difficult to do. You know, the, the firms that are training are not the same than the firms which are not training. And, you, and you're right, maybe the numbers are not as high. But even in those studies, which are trying to control rigorously for the selection problem, and we talk about them in the book, you do see that there are significant gains from training. So increases in value added that could then be shared between profits and wages. Yet, it doesn't happen. Very few firms train. Why? Well, I'm afraid that Part of the answer is that training is not always a good idea. If you are looking at businesses in low productivity sectors, operating with traditional technologies, hiring on skilled labor, well, investing in formal training, at least for them, is not a good idea. And taxing them for not doing so is a terrible idea. We're going to talk, be talking more about that because it's a problem that happens often. Actually, the, the, the firms that train are the ones that are adopting new technologies, innovating, entering the export sectors, and they already have more skilled workers. But even among them, there is a lot of variance. So what we do in the book, and this is, I think, a, an interesting contribution based on the review of the literature, we come up with all the list of things, with a list of things that can go wrong. And we group them in three. Problems with labor markets and product markets, Problems with capital markets and decision-making problems. Let me just mention a few of them, the most important, when you come to labor markets. Poaching. If you are an employer, you are providing training, but this training is not firm-specific, you might see other employers trying to poach your workers. And this is not a theoretical possibility. In the surveys that we have, we do see that between 30 and 40% of the firms which are not training don't do it because of poaching or because of high turnover rates, basically workers leaving. Another problem that is not discussed enough, I think, but should receive more attention is excessive market power by employers, to the point that they are able to either depress wages or at least not share in an equitable way gains in productivity. Then you can imagine that this situation, empl employees are less willing to also invest in new skills for themselves. There is the problem of coordination failures that we discuss mainly in the case of in low-income settings. 
basically the case of businesses operating with uh, low productivity technologies not willing to innovate because they cannot find the works that have the skills, at least in the region where they operate. While at the same time, the workers are not willing to invest in higher skills because there are no jobs that need those skills. This chicken and egg problem, we discuss it in the book in the chapter on technical vocational education and training. And we argue actually that this is why TVT has actually often failed in the case of the agricultural sector. I don't have to tell you about capital markets. It's not easy to get financing to, to finance education and training. But I don't want to make a couple of points about decision-making problems. The idea here is that even if you have perfect markets, you will still have individuals who either do not invest enough in training or do not inv invest in the right skills because either they have high discount rates, they have bias expectations about the future, they don't know what the skills are that are in demand, or simply because they do not have the basic cognitive and non-cognitive skills to enter the training programs and complete them successfully. Before I finish, I would like to tell you about some of the solution policy recommendations that we discuss uh, in the book. And as I said at the beginning, many of these don't have anything to do with setting up training systems. They are more about enabling investments in the right skills. And there are five, uh, five propositions that I think that countries should explore further. One is about setting and enforcing contracts so that employers can deal with poaching externalities. And I hope that Klaus Silverman here is going to tell us a little bit about these programs in the case of Germany. Number two, empowering workers, for instance, by providing access to unemployment benefits or by promoting the use of productivity link wages, like in the case of Malaysia. Three, disseminating information. First of all, the labor market. What are the job opportunities? What are the demands for skills? What are the wages for different occupations? What is the type of competition that you have? Also about the quality of different providers, hopefully based on an analysis of what is happening with the graduates from these programs when they enter the labor market. Number four, and this is very important, do use financial in incentives to try to promote investments in training, both for workers and for employers. Do it mainly to deal with problems related to decision making. And if you do it, try to finance this through general revenues, not payroll taxes, which is uh, how it is done often. And hopefully Miguel today is also going to tell us about these pro programs in the case of Mexico. The issue of the coordination failures. In the book, we talk about public-private partnerships to try to develop certain sectors, industries, in particular regions. It can be tourism, it can be agro-industry. These are more controversial because, in a way, they imply picking up winners. But if you ask the private sector to take sufficient risk, it could happen. And actually, this has been the experience with TVET in countries such as Korea and Singapore that we also discuss uh, in the book. Number three, very important, develop targeted training programs to vulnerable workers. Workers which are not going to be able to access, they are not accessing TVET or on-the-job training. This would be integrated packages of services that include training, life skills, maybe basic cognitive skills, technical skills, managing, uh, managing a business, the basics. But they will also link the beneficiaries to either subsidize internships or to programs that support entrepreneurship. And finally, dealing with systematic government failures, which affect mostly TVT, technical vocational education and training. There is a very large literature out there, but in the book we summarize these reforms around four points, four areas. One, making more use of these apex independent institutions that bring the private sector on board. And basically, their role is to coordinate training policies between ministries and between levels of government. Number two, deal with the training centers, give them more autonomy more independence in managing the flow of students, curricula, the number of teachers. Of course, while changing at the same time the financing mechanisms so that they are paid reimbursed based on the services they provide, the results they achieve. And last but not least, modernizing monitoring and evaluation system, improving the flows of information that policymakers have to manage these, uh, these programs. I want to end with three quick comments about some of the, the implications that the book has for the work we do here, not only at the bank, uh, outside the bank, in the countries. And there are three areas. One is about uh, new tools. 
tools that will allow policymakers to truly understand what is happening in labor markets when it comes to skills. Tools to be able to measure the distribution of the skills in the labor force, the demands that the skills that employers have in terms of the skills, but also the factors that might be hindering investments in the right skills. At the Anchor, we are piloting one of these tools now in around 10 countries, and I hope that more countries are going, are going to join. Then there is the issue of design and implementation. All of us here can agree on the big picture, the policies, the strategies, but the question is how you design and implement these programs. How do you make them work? Uh, as I give you an example, we're talking about training programs. How to set the curricula, the duration, the delivery mechanism. How do we target subsidies to firms or workers? How do we identify these beneficiaries? How do we track them over time? What are the best contracting and payment systems? We don't have the answers, but what we see from the evaluations that we discuss in the book is that context matters a lot, to the point where we're, we are not going to have a universal design or universal implementation arrangements that you can apply in any country. The implication then is that we need to do a better job, a more systematic job, at piloting and evaluating any reform or new program that is considered in a given country. The last point is about knowledge sharing. I think we also need to do a better job at tracking innovations that are taking place across country, gathering the knowledge that these innovations are producing and sharing this knowledge. We need to do a better work at sharing information, learning from each other between regions in the bank, sectors in the bank, but also between institutions and of course, uh, and of course between countries. So thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, David, for the quick run through, and we're going to get into some of the details of those key findings and messages from, from the book. Uh, let me now introduce uh, my panelists, but before I do that, maybe I'll introduce myself first. I'm Tamar Manuel Yanatinch, I'm the Vice President of the Human Development Network uh, in the bank. So let me start with Miguel on my right. Dr. Miguel Zekeli is the director of the Institute for Innovation in Education at the Tecnologico de Monterrey in Mexico. Between 2006 and January 2010, he was undersecretary for middle education. Between 2002 and 2006, he served as the undersecretary for planning and evaluation at the Ministry of Social Development. He worked as Chief of the Office of Regional Development at the Office of the President of Mexico during 2001, as Research Economist at the Inter-American Development ba Bank from 96 to 2001, and as Researcher in the Economics Department at uh, El Colegio de Mexico between 89 and 93. He's a specialist in education and social policy for Mexico and Latin America, and has researched widely on the topics of inequality, poverty, and education. We have a wonderfully diverse panel today, a great combination of academics, current former policy makers, and representatives from the private sector. Uh, so it's uh, really delightful to be able to moderate this session. Next, I'll turn to, on my left, Professor Adriana Kugler. Uh, she's the chief economist uh, to the U.S. Labor Secretary. She's currently on leave from her position as full professor of public policy at Georgetown University. Dr. Kugler is also a research associate with NBER in the Labor Studies Program. She's also a research fellow of the CEPR, ISA, the Center for Research and Analysis of Migration, the Center for the Study of Poverty and Inequality at Stanford University. She serves on the editorial boards of the Industrial and Labor Relations Review, the British Journal of Industrial Relations, Labor Economics, and Economia. Dr. Kugos has published widely about the impact of public policies on employment and earnings. She has also written on the topic of immigration and its impacts on both receiving and sending countries. Dr. Kugler was a recipient of the John T. Dunlop Outstanding Scholar Award from the Labor and Employment Relations Association in recognition of her research contributions to the field of labor and industrial relations. Pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, Branka Minich, uh, over on my right again, is Director for Global Corporate and Government Affairs at Manpower. She was Manpower's first Director of Workforce Development and led the design and implementation of Manpower's TechReach program, a comprehensive training and placement initiative aimed at increasing the employability and earnings of highly marginalized labor force groups. 
She has worked with international organizations, with government agencies in the U.S. and abroad, and with NGOs. Branca engages the manpower organization in projects that create bridge to employment for disadvantaged groups such as refugees, youth, and victims' exploitation or disaster. Good to have you here with us, Branca. Uh, Dr. Mona Morshed, on my left, is a partner and co-leader of global education practice at McKinsey & Company, the Middle East office. She leads McKinsey's education practice in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Her work in system reform spans schools, vocational and tertiary levels across both strategy and implementation. She's the co-author of the book, How the World's Best Performing School Systems Come Out on Top, a study which identified the common attributes of the world's top performing and fast improving school systems. She has led the strategy and implementation of programs to improve education systems in a number of countries, including in the GCC, South America, and Asia. Good to have you with us, Mona. And last but not least, Professor Klaus Zimmermann is founder and director of ISA, the Germany-based Institute for the Study of Labor. Uh, that operates an international network of about 1,200 economists and researchers spanning across more than 45 countries in the world. He's professor at Bonn University and honorary professor at the Free University of Berlin and Renmin University of, of China in Beijing. He's editor-in-chief of the Journal of Population Economics and the ISA Journal series. He has held prestigious academic positions in Germany, Belgium, and the US, Canada, and Japan. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman is author of, or editor of 45 books and over 115 papers. Um, good to have you here with us, Klaus. So let me start first with Miguel, if I may. I want to start uh, by talking about on-the-job training with you. Uh, as you know, and as David mentioned, many countries try to promote on-the-job training by setting up training funds, usually financed out of payroll taxes. And as David mentioned, uh, much of the evidence that we have shows that these can actually reduce formal employment. The funds are typically used to reimburse the taxes paid by the companies that provide the training. And those tend usually to be the large companies as well. So the book uh, argues that this policy can be misplaced that instead of taxing firms that do not train or exempting uh, from taxes from firms that would have trained anyways, that tends to be the case with the large firms, governments should be targeting subsidies to those firms that face greater difficulty in overcoming the market failures that David talked about, such as their credit uh, constraints, lack of information, issues with poaching, et cetera. What do you think about the approach that is being proposed in the book? And what has Mexico done that might inform this issue for us today? Miguel. Can I go over here? Of I course. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with such distinguished panelists and uh, we're commenting on, on a very important book. And, um, no, I don't know. Ah, went to the end. There it is, okay. And uh, I will, of course, address this, this question. I wanted to give also uh, some related uh, comments. Uh, but before going directly into the question, uh, I think that in, uh, just to uh, summarize it in one line, I think this is a very good book at the right time. And uh, the reason why this is a very good book at the right time is that uh, there is this perceived mismatch between the supply of human resources and the demand of human resources in many countries in the world. And uh, I think uh, that this mismatch merits uh, a couple of comments also because the book goes right uh, to the heart of the problem, but 
the context in which it is um, addressed, uh, I think is very useful uh, and particularly adequate for, for the current times. Uh, this book uh, would not have been as interesting if it had been done 30, 40 years ago for several reasons. One reason is that uh, human capital has become uh, a much more important factor of production as compared to capital, to physical capital, again, as compared as 30, 40 years ago. So whatever happens to the accumulation of human capital where the development of skills uh, play a very important role, that is a, a very, very relevant issue today. But secondly, and this goes uh, to uh, one of the reasons behind the, this mismatch, is that uh, the world has changed in many dimensions, but one critical one is the pace of change. Uh, again, 40 years ago, uh, the way the productive sectors were set and uh, the production uh, systems required uh, change over time, but uh, one of the characteristics was that workers could specialize in one particular task or area and be productive throughout many years or even throughout their whole uh, working life by performing the same activity because uh, the pace of change of the way in which things were produced was not uh, that fast. Today, of course, that is uh, totally different. And the rhythm at which knowledge, innovation is taking place requires of different skills every year, all the time, new skills that perhaps weren't even thought of five years ago are very relevant today. But also even having those skills that are very relevant today doesn't guarantee that the same person will have very, relative, very relevant skills in five years. Skills are not, as before, just a set of, of competencies, of abilities that you have for the rest of your life. The, the, the rhythm at which each person can adapt to new circumstances becomes a very critical issue. And uh, this is, of course, uh, why uh, the mismatch uh, needs to be addressed, but also why the, all the analysis that the book has on the market failures that are impeding or that are a restriction uh, for, the, uh, for speeding up the process are, are so important. Analyzing, first of all, identifying those uh, market failures is a first step, a necessary step for then taking better uh, policy decisions. And again, perhaps 50 years ago, 40 years ago, it was important, but not as critical as it is today. Uh, the book very clearly talks about the causes of this mismatch currently and about some solutions. And uh, going now to the, to the question, uh, I think that uh, the book gives a very clear view of the market failures and of the solutions, but one area where I think uh, more analysis in the future will be needed is uh, why even the policies that uh, just by following common sense would be uh, expected to uh, be able to face these market failures are not uh, having uh, their effect. And uh, I think that uh, in design, in the policy design, and this goes uh, to the question, uh, one of the critical issues is that when the government intervenes in a setting where you have all these market failures, one concern is that by implementing a government action, you don't want to create even further uh, disincentives or, or you don't want to introduce new incentives that distort uh, the market any, any further. And one particular concern is that when uh, training policies or TVET uh, policies are introduced, in some sense, uh, this is a way of making some workers more attractive with respect to others. When the labor market is creating uh, many, many jobs, that might not be an issue. But with a tight labor market where employment is not growing at a fast pace, Making some workers more attractive might mean displacing other workers, particularly older workers that don't have that, that find it more difficult to adapt to new circumstances. So any policy, even when it's designed under common sense, might create these distortions that end up affecting other workers, creating uh, creating secondary negative effects, or they might even create incentives to overemploy certain uh, types of, of workers. 
And uh, a particular example, and this uh, is for, for Mexico, is a program uh, that uh, was started in the year 2006 to uh, try to uh, expand the opportunities for young workers in particular under what would seem a very reasonable uh, design under this analysis of market imperfections. With all these market imperfections, uh, what happens if you do two things? One is give workers or young workers a sort of scholarship, uh, a cash transfer, so that they can uh, be trained in uh, different types of schemes. And on the other hand, give the, the firm also a subsidy to get this worker in the firm at no cost. And the only thing that the firm has to do is to train this person. After a while, if they don't want to hire the person, they don't have to. And, uh, but if they want to hire the person, of course they do. Uh, and uh, a government intervention of this type would seem reasonable. The problem with something as basic as that, which is in fact one of the, the, the type of programs that, is, that are being implemented uh, today, are that uh, if, if you're only concerned with the employment